Welcome to Neighborly. Metamorphoses. House number 15. Little Street. Bodies I have in mind, and how they change to assume new shapes. I ask the help of the gods who know the trick. Change me, and let me glimpse the secret and speak, better than I know how, of the world's birthing and the creation of all things, from the first to the very latest. Mary Zimmerman, from her play Metamorphoses, based on the work of Ovid. The frame trails behind a being of ethereal grace walking down a street that they do not match. Many have tried to describe them. I have spent hours attempting to do so, but no words in this language, or any other utterance from mortal throat, seem to fit just right. Our view pulls back, and we watch as they set slender steps up to the front stoop of house number 15, placing a hand against the royal purple door. They sigh. The house sighs with them, and thus becomes a temple of alabaster stone, grand and unattainable. Today, then, it matches its occupant. Unattainable is certainly the word for them. No, wait, not an occupant. Perhaps they are the owner of the house. Perhaps they are of the house. Perhaps they are the house. You see, there is a house on Little Street with a door as purple as the Milky Way peeking through clouds in a biting winter twilight. And although I do so dearly wish I could say more, there is simply nothing about it that remains constant aside from that. It has been here since existence, since forever. It has been everywhere and nowhere for just as long. This does not come as a surprise. Many things on this quiet side of town are not as they seem, didn't you realize? Of course, you would have noticed. There are a few peculiar houses on Little Street that refuse to stay in their proper boxes. Those who could not cross their T's and dot their I's if their very being depended on it. Number 5 and number 15 would get along in that regard. They are never quite the same on any given day of the week. But where the former refuses to maintain a viewable form at all, the house we find ourselves outside of will never hold the same shape for more than a cycle of the sun and moon. But that's of no concern to you. And it's of no concern to the man who ascends the steps, drunk on love and sobered by awe. In a moment of thought, maybe, the immortal one would be reminded of an old flame while looking at him. It was centuries past, this much can be certain, but the way his bronze curled hair falls past the nape of his neck makes them smile. They take a pleasant moment to watch him as he approaches. He's pretty. He is very pretty. Not one for any interesting conversation, they think to themselves, but neither of the pair are really interested in conversation this evening anyway. He makes impulsive decisions, an appreciated, unpredictable element in the monotonous passage of days. They're delighted to be an impulsive decision, for tonight they are a brief flicker in his life as much as he is in theirs. The moment he reaches the doorstep of this grand architectural feat, It fills with warm, golden sunlight. It may be past dusk on Little Street, but number 15 is exempt from the laws of time and space. Why wouldn't it be? Both things are fickle and flighty, and the house takes care of them so that the being who resides within doesn't have to. The Immortal One has had enough of time and its twisted games. The house's resident and their companion exchange a glance, and he nods, accepting their silent invitation. There is a gentle twist of the host's slim wrist, the absence of a creak from the purple door, and the gentle click of heels and dress shoes on marble as the two enter the temple. The new radiant beams press their shadows onto pristinely chiseled floors. No matter how cold and how towering this house may look, it feels welcoming once a man like the sun personified begins to move through it, and all he can do is stare around bewildered. The blankness of his expression, perhaps a lack of thought, is not at all unusual for him. It's somewhat ironic that he's brought back to reality by someone so impossible 
but when their graceful hand finds its way to gently cup his face, he takes a moment to recognize that he has never felt more alive. The world is not so large when he looks at them. The house is not so vast when he has them to focus on. There are no anxieties when he carefully presses his lips against theirs. The next morning, the immortal one wakes up alone. They always wake up alone. The house and its resident do not take kindly to frequent guests, to overstayed welcomes. There is safety in fleeting companionship and danger in attachment. Eternity is quite a long time, but they find brief solace in a night of company, and contentment in that night being enough. The next evening there is a woman with hair as blue as the churning tides. The house accepts her and becomes a cottage by the ocean, with a sea breeze blowing through the back porch regardless of the weather elsewhere on Little Street. The two wouldn't need to be out on the beach to feel it. Her voice is as sweet as a siren's, and she finds herself reaching out to the immortal one, drawn like the waves to the moon. They keep each other's pleasant company for hours, playing cards and drinking on creaking unfinished hardwoods. As the crash of laughter mingles with the surf against the sand, our view pulls back to appreciate number 15's new form. There is absolutely nothing in the world like being alone with someone else. In this seaside abode, it's hard not to enjoy it. It's tans and greys and navies. It's lines and curves and spirals. Everything is moonlight and starshine and the brightest glow of momentary infatuation. After that evening, there was another one. Such is the way of linear movement through reality. Their companion for the third night in a row was... He was... He is already gone from their memory, they realize, as they stretch and look about the room. It's glaringly modern, minimalist in style, no colour or feeling or movement. The immortal one wraps themselves in a white duvet and lets the cold tile against their feet wake them up. The house doesn't suit them today. They feel like a puzzle piece haphazardly shoved where it does not fit, flailing for anything to hold onto. Separation from the building that inhabits them as much as they inhabit it is far too much to bear. It weighs on them. Fatigues them. It makes their limbs heavy and sets their heads spinning until they find themselves lying on the ground staring up at the unfamiliar ceiling. As their hair pools around their weary head, they are struck by an antithetical fear. It creeps into their veins like freezing, brackish water. It leaves a hollow ache in their chest that makes them struggle to breathe. Having been detached from mortality for so long, they've started to grow so needy for companionship in others. And it terrifies them. They fear the state of being that will force them to take a steady form and watch the passage of years as anything but a time lapse that they may solely stand still in. They sigh, closing their eyes, and number 15 sighs with them. This form of the house shall pass. It has never been the same before, and it will never be the same again. There was a moment in the past when the expanse of time did not seem as vast to them. The immortal one muses to themselves of their first century, when they thought life was something to be cherished instead of letting it slip through their fingers like sand. The house has been around for as long as time itself, but the immortal one has not. They have just been weathered by the years spent oscillating between love and loss until no jagged passions remain. Lovers glow until they burn out. Lovers bloom until they wilt and fall apart. Wary and unresponsive, the occupant of number 15 floats through existence, relying on nights of company to fill the hole in the fabric of their very being that aches for constancy and connection, which tears ever fuller by the minute. In reality, the only current constant in their life is the fact that they will never have to remain the same, and that thought brings them out of their unsettling haze. They decide they will take a break from their nightly routine today. Their business is an exhausting one. 
They spend the day in languid melancholy, wandering around this house they do not belong in. The large majority of their expansive life has been spent alone with their thoughts. There's no reason why this instance should be shaking them so much. They survive until sundown, somehow, and celebrate by sitting on the front steps with a glass of Prosecco. But they venture no further than that, content with the cover that porch provides. The usual bronze and orange rays of sunset on Little Treat are obscured by an absolute downpour. Petrichor and the reassuring smell of rain on warm pavement rising lazily from the earth. There is no breeze to create a reprieve, no single spot of evening sky between the thick grey cloud cover. There is, however, an absence of thunder. The heavens are not anguished. Instead, they provide a soothing white noise in an atmosphere that weighs like a heavy embrace. There is something ancient about the energy in the air, something timeless. And then there is her. She dances underneath a street light to music all her own. She lets the raindrops soak her dress through, chilling her bones. She has eyes that are brown like the earth beneath her feet, deep and grounded. They are not mysterious, they are not elusive, they are not overly complex. They are the kind eyes that scream, life. Life can be held within them. Something could be fostered there, could be nurtured and grow. She... She is everything. The Immortal One doesn't even remember sounding. All they know is that they are moving toward her, and they never want to be any further from her than they are in that instant ever again. They break their promise of an evening solitude. Why would they ever want to be alone when she exists? When they hold out their hand, they forgot to ask her if she'd like to include them in her dance. Luckily for them, she's already pulling them in. Two shadows waltz underneath a streetlight across from house number 15 on Little Street until their feet grow sore, their collective breath becomes ragged, and their sopping wet clothing makes them trip one time too many. The music of the night plays for them until they find themselves back on the porch, sheltered, safe. And then they are laughing, tangled in a ragged embrace. They share sips from the bottle left there haphazardly and watch as the earth is washed clean. As the Immortal One crouches down to retrieve their neglected glass, they hear her footsteps across the creaking wooden boards, the sound making their head whip round. She lays a hand on the doorknob. The raindrops freeze in midair as if they too realise that no one has ever dared try to enter without first being allowed in. No one has ever been so ambitious, so curious, so intent to stay. The Immortal One's chiselled features are struck with a look of abstract horror. They have never felt this kind of fear before. The air is thick in their lungs as they watch, waiting for the worst to happen. But she sighs. And the house sighs with her. And it becomes a home. There is a safety that cannot be described in words. There is a grace too beautiful to name. As much as I would love to tell you what number 15 looked like that night, well... Home looks different to all of us, does it not? There is a bedroom, and within it there are two beings. Never before have two people so perfectly belonged in a time or space. Laying beside the immortal one, she whispers into their hair. What is your name? You must have a name. And indeed they did. They had used many names over their expansive existence, but not for decades, for centuries. Names carry a certain inescapable permanence. But they speak, and when they do, they know not why they were drawn to do so. Alcyone, they murmur. Alcyone. She repeats the name, letting it hang softly in the air. 
It is an unspoken pact between them. And it says one word, Alcyone, again and again, Alcyone, my treasure, Alcyone, and this is the end of the world. The next afternoon, Alcyone wakes up alone. They always wake up alone. The home and its resident do not take kindly to frequent guests to overstayed welcomes. There is safety in fleeting companionship, danger in attachment. But while their bed may be empty, the smell of fresh coffee floats through their open door. Their trembling fingers clasp the buttons on their shirt as they pad through cozy hallways, and sure enough, there she is. Her feet dangle above the floor as she sits on the counter, a mug cupped gently in her hand, and a smile dancing across their lips as soon as they lock eyes. It is bordering on sundown. Who is to say how much time has passed while they were together? Who is to say how long Alcyone was asleep? She murmurs their name, beckons them forward. They ignore the way their throat goes tight. They ignore the realization that threatens them with tears. Number 15 has not changed. For the first time in its existence, the ever-shifting house with the purple door stands still. Alcyone cannot claim consciousness, instead watching as their ethereal form moves over to their companion. Their arms wrap around her waist and their head lays itself gently on her shoulder. We can see that they are holding on so gently, as if perhaps they think that if they hold her too light she'll crumble to ash in their hands. She lets out a small laugh, letting her mug rest on the counter as her fingers run idly through their hair, and the background noise of everyday life fades away. There is nothing in the world but their hearts beating in sync, their gentle breaths, and the words she begins to mutter under her breath. Rambles of, how did you sleep, and are you alright, and sorry for helping myself. Doting, you look so lovelies, and you're even graceful when you're drowsies, and you look a bit vacant, darling, and... No, seriously, are you alright, Alcyone? They break away fast enough to make her gasp, at home again within their own body, eyes wild and darting. They're shaking so much now they're not even trying to hide it. This new fear is the only thing they know as they stare her down, and suddenly... They know the name of their suffering. It is her. It is their connection. It is a murmured Alcyone. You see, now that there is a name to their being, there's no escape. This woman, this visitor, this companion, this mortal, she torments them. She holds the audacity to stay and the nerve to, to make them stay. She will not let them fade into another existence, but all they wish is to be everything and nothing at once. There is nothing more personal than an argument born of pure anguish. As much as I would like to share the words Alcyone slung with an uncharacteristic fire, they dare not be uttered again. As much as I would like to show you the confusion and pain that cross their companion's face, such glances are too painful to be repeated. It takes a certain level of denial to project centuries of anguish onto the first person who has ever truly belonged in your idea of home. What Alcyone cannot seem to realize as they watch her move to the front door, coffee still warm on the counter, is that connections like theirs are once in a lifetime. Some part of them wishes she would turn back and give them the satisfaction of one last glance. She does not. Number 15 creaks and shifts on an unsteady foundation. Walls come crashing down, debris covers the floor, each time barely missing its inhabitant. As the roof shakes and the glass shatters, Alcyone falls to their knees, and then sinks down further, curled on the floor where their shuddering sobs can be muffled by the chaos surrounding them. The house is trying so hard to recover from its loss, grieving a connection so deeply made and so quickly shattered. And Alcyone grieves, too.
There is a house on Little Street with a door as purple as the Milky Way peeking through clouds in a biting winter twilight. And although I do so dearly wish I could say more, I must keep Alcyone in mind. They have been here since existence, since forever. They may have been everywhere and nowhere for just as long. Their house is a gorgeous thing today, although it's only been able to keep one room since everything came crashing down. If you are invited inside, you may observe the arcing cathedral ceilings and the intricate window that makes up the entire back wall. Peering through, we see the house's occupant come into focus. Alcyone lies in a forest green chaise lounge, a rotary phone in their lap and the receiver in their hand. Their bone-white hair falls in waves down to their waist and hangs around their shoulders loosely, still a little damp from a shower earlier that morning. Although crinkled in a smile, their violet eyes glow with a light that they thought they may have lost completely some time ago. Progress is not a thing that can be quantified. Progress, my dearest friends, is not linear. There were nights when Alcyone thought they would never move from the vigil on the floor of their destroyed home again. But then there were nights when they found the strength to get to their feet. One thing was for certain. The house would not be changing for them this time. Glass was swept, beams were repaired, debris was removed. Walls were painted, furniture was built, art was replaced. In creating a place to call home again, Alcyone was struggling to find a home within themselves. They're still struggling, as they feel a now familiar ache in their chest return at the thought that one of the very connections they've feared for so long speaks on the other end of the phone call. While warm and consoling, they think to themselves, nothing will ever fill their heart completely again. It is one circumstance to have lost something without knowing its weight, and another entirely to feel the whole left after it has been torn from your being. There is some promise made into the receiver that hangs lazily in their hand. Nobody is on the line, awaiting for some explanation for where Alcyone has been, what has happened to them, who they've become. Their hesitant promise, as they set down the receiver, is that answers will come in time. In truth, the figure that steps out onto the front steps of house number 15 isn't quite sure if they have the answers that nobody will need. All they are certain of is this. They can no longer run from their connection to this world. And they will change. Neighborly is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 international license. Today's house was written by Emily Lars and edited by Matthew O.K. Smith, with music by Alex Schwartz and art by Cloudy Appelart. The narrator is voiced by Matthew O.K. Smith. To find out more, visit neighborlypod.card.co or follow us on social media at neighborlypod. If you enjoyed listening today, information on how you can support us will be included in the episode description. But most of all, we would appreciate it if you told a friend. Because they might tell a friend, and they might tell a friend, and who knows? Eventually God might finally listen to us. Today's cognitive phenomenon is cognitive dissonance. Thanks for listening. Come back soon.